Hello, my friends. Welcome to my library. My name is Amitriptyline, and I'd like to tell you a story. This story takes place on an island. This island was once described by many as the most beautiful island in the Caribbean. Seeing it for the first time, Christopher Columbus said, quote, The best land in Castile could not be compared with it. And in his journal, wrote, Comparing the lands they had seen before with these, said that there was no comparison between them, nor did the plain of Cordoba come near them, the difference being as great as between night and day. This island has many names, called by Spain, Hispaniola, by France, San Domingue, and by the people who lived there, Haiti. The French colony there was the most profitable colony in the world in the 18th century, and looked to continue to be into the 19th. Generating vast wealth, it exported millions of pounds of sugar, coffee, and cotton every year. Its wealth and beauty earned it the nickname, the Pearl of the Antilles. That isn't what people think of today when they think of the country of Haiti. Modern Haiti is among the poorest countries in the world. Riots paralyze the country, while starvation and poverty kill thousands. Many think of it today as a place unable to support a stable government, or even just the place where people eat mud. How can a nation go from being so rich to being so poor? How is it that the Dominican Republic, a nation on the same island, can be so comparatively wealthy? There is, of course, no single reason, but I would like to put forward an idea to you, an idea of a factor that may be more important than any other single factor, and it involves a certain bank in the United States. Our story starts in 1821. The United States has just elected its fifth president, James Monroe, to a second term. Future Queen Victoria is but two years old, and King George IV reigns in England. In Germany, Ludwig von Beethoven prepares to write his ninth and final symphony. And in Central and South America, the destabilization in Spain following Napoleon's invasion has led to the breakaway of one Spanish colony after another. Santo Domingo, a colony which shares an island with the independent nation of Haiti, declares its own independence in December of 1821 and calls itself Spanish Haiti. Haiti controls the west side of the island of Hispaniola, and Spanish Haiti, the east. The former French colony of Haiti was a nation beset by troubles. The president, Jean-Pierre Boyer, had just united a nation split by various factions. Since the Haitian Revolution began, decades before, mass destruction of property, invasion after invasion, massacres, and counter-massacres had utterly destroyed the Haitian economy. Though the Haitian Revolution finally ended in 1804, over 17 years before our story begins, the Haitian GDP was still one-third of what it was before the war. The whole country had struggled to recapture the economic power it once had, and Boyer had a plan. You see, Haiti was unique among all the nations of the world. Haiti was a former slave colony, and the only one in the world where the slaves rose up, threw off their chains, and defeated their European would-be masters. With a 21st century perspective, you might think that a brand new nation like this would want to encourage foreign investment to rebuild its economy. But it's said that the people of Haiti only bow to tie their shoes. The Haitian constitution explicitly outlawed foreigners from owning property in Haiti to ensure that the people would never again be beholden to foreign powers. They wanted to rebuild themselves on their own. They didn't want rich Europeans buying up the plantations, or worse, bringing back slavery. Boyer's plan was simple. Keep the French Navy anchored in Europe long enough to unite Haiti with the other new nations in the Caribbean, and create a new world alliance strong enough to abolish slavery for good. 
Needless to say, there were a lot of countries that had a problem with this policy. The imperial powers wanted Haiti's potential profits, and they sought to punish it for its non-compliance. France refused to recognize the independence of the nation, and the other countries of Europe were inclined to agree with France, as they had colonies of their own in the Caribbean, and they didn't want anyone getting any ideas. The United States had millions of slaves of its own, and southern politicians refused to allow the first democracy in the Western Hemisphere to recognize Haiti. Recognizing a nation of former slaves was just too dangerous to the slaveholders. After all, if slaves could free themselves there, they could do it anywhere. Haiti's only friend, Simone Bolivar's nation of Grand Colombia, was still struggling with its own independence and fighting amongst itself, so it was of little help. The powers of Europe and America had placed an embargo on Haiti, so the once prosperous trading nation had no one to sell to. There was another problem on the horizon. France was no longer ruled by the democratic French Republic and its rights of man. The monarchy had been restored to the throne and was taking bitter revenge on the people who had wronged it. Former landowners from Haiti continuously pushed the government to send another army to retake the country. They wanted their property back, both land and people. It seemed that such an invasion was getting more and more likely by the year. Haiti had to prepare. The Haitians were not unaware of the threat posed by France, and had been building up a powerful army of over 50,000 men, and building defenses all along the coast. This included a massive stone fortress, the Citadel La Ferrière, which was one of the largest buildings in the Western Hemisphere. Built on top of a mountain facing the coast, it had over 360 cannons ready to defend Haiti from even the largest invading army. President Jean-Pierre Boyer knew that France would have a hard fight if it tried to invade Haiti from the west, but there was a big weakness. The Republic of Haiti only controlled half of the island. He looked across the border at Spanish Haiti. Spanish Haiti was still a slave state. If France wanted to launch an attack, they could offer concessions and protection in return for ports to land an army. At the same time, even over 30 years before Abraham Lincoln would make a speech on the topic in the United States, Boyer knew that the island of Hispaniola could never remain half slave and half free. And so, Boyer put his plan into action. Boyer began negotiations with the king in France over terms to possibly end their conflict. Meanwhile, using clever negotiation with the black population of the East and a show of force, his armies marched across the border and with barely firing a shot, annexed Spanish Haiti and unified the island in 1822. Things were starting to turn around Boyer freed the slaves of the Dominican side of the island and nationalized the property that was owned by the foreigners there. Boyer kept France occupied with negotiations. He rejected a series of deals with France, which required various terms, such as repaying France for the war that they fought for their own independence, or turning Haiti into what we would call today a Commonwealth of France. But in 1824... Tragedy struck for Boyer's plans. Louis XVIII, King of France, died. His brother was crowned Charles X. Charles X was far, far more conservative than his brother, and immediately began attempts to restore France to the way it was before the French Revolution. For Haiti, this meant 14 warships heading for its coast. Charles's demands were simple. 150 million francs in gold to repay the landowners who had their land stolen by the people of Haiti, the full sum to be paid back in five years, and to give France a 50% reduction to all customs and trade taxes. With no allies to call, Boyer was faced with a choice. Yet another destructive war to ravage his homeland, or the ultimatum. Boyer didn't want to put his people through that, and despite the preparations felt he had no choice but to sign on the dotted line in 1825. 
Boye hoped he could buy Haitian freedom, but this is where Haiti's real troubles began. The blockade on Haiti's ports was over, and trade finally opened. France finally recognized Haitian independence along with the rest of Europe. America, for its flaws, would not recognize or trade with Haiti until after the U.S. Civil War, some 40 years later. But recognition came at a crushing cost. 150 million francs was an incredible sum for the small nation. That's the modern equivalent of $67 billion. That was 10 times the national budget, and almost 3 times the entire GDP of Haiti at the time. Charles X was well aware of this information when he set the terms, and pushed the demands anyway. He had never intended for Haiti to be able to afford it. It was going to be an eternal debt that Haiti would owe to France to pay for its own freedom, which subsequent generations would call the Haitian Indemnity. Charles X's agreement with Boyer required Haiti to finance any debt on the Indemnity through a French bank. The French king refused payment in any form except gold. When December of 1825 rolled around, and Haiti had not managed to multiply its national budget ten times, 30 million francs in gold were taken out of a bank in Paris in Haiti's name, and brought into the royal treasury down the street in what amounted to a loan ceremony. This loan to Haiti, who never saw the money, was provided at a 6% annual interest. For handling this transaction on Haiti's behalf, the French banking establishment charged a service fee of another 6 million francs, so the full 30 million taken out of the bank on Haiti's behalf did not reach the treasury, only 24 did, and the remaining 6 million went right back to the bank. For handling this transaction on Haiti's behalf, the French banking establishment charged a service fee of another 6 million francs, so the full 30 million taken out of the bank on Haiti's behalf did not reach the treasury, only 24 did, and the remaining 6 million went right back to the bank and was added as debt to the account. Historians call this the double debt, because it's debt accrued by paying off more debt, like being forced to mortgage a house to pay off medical debt. Boyer scrambled to get money to pay off the double debt. He knew exactly what kind of disaster it would be for his country if the debt continued to multiply, as France charged fee after fee and interest upon interest. France clearly intended to bankrupt the nation, and used the debt as justification to seize the country once again. Boyer ordered his troops to seize all of the gold coins on the island, which led Haiti to switch to fiat currency the following year, but it wasn't nearly enough. In 1826, the second payment came due. A new set of bankers had purchased the debt and gave Haiti another loan. This second 30 million franc loan was to be paid back over 35 years at massive interest rates. The total expected payment, by the end, was projected to be 225 million more francs, on top of the 90 million francs still owed to France, and the millions that it owed to the first bank. Boyer had enough. He stopped payments to the French crown, and he stopped the 50% customs reduction. However, he wanted Haiti to be seen as a nation that honored international finance, and instead of defaulting entirely, tried merely to pay off his existing debt to the banks. Boyer raised taxes sky high, but he couldn't even meet the payments to service Haiti's interest, let alone the principal of the debt. Within two years, Haiti was bankrupt, with a projected outlay of 375 million francs between the two loans, the double debt, and the remaining indemnity. That's a total of $250 billion in today's money. At this point, Boyer ceased all payments on the debts, and instead focused on trying to rebuild his economy. In 1830, France had deposed the hated King Charles X, and the new king, Louis Philippe, had bigger worries than Haiti. Louis Philippe instead hired the Delaws Law Firm to review the ordinances that Charles had imposed, and to order Haiti to pay up on behalf of France. Things didn't go as Louis Philippe had expected, however. Delaws found that not only was the indemnity imposed on Haiti illegal, but that France itself, not Haiti, was on the hook for repaying the former slaveholders. Louis Philippe quietly filed away the Delaws report, where it was ignored. Instead, a new round of negotiations were started. 
With the Delaz report as some leverage on the Haitian side, and another fleet of warships on the French side, Boyer's men managed to convince Louis-Philippe's more friendly government to reduce the indemnity, but could not convince Louis-Philippe to eliminate it. The remainder would be 60 million francs, paid in annual installments for the next 30 years. Once again, to facilitate payment, debt and interest would be owed to France's banks. The existing debt from the first loan was also refinanced at a much lower rate, one intended for Haiti to actually pay. The 1826 loan, having been defaulted on and obviously unpayable, was cancelled by Louis-Philippe. And so, with new terms, began Haiti's second round of debt payments. In order to meet the obligations, Boyer implemented harsh austerity measures on his people. The Code Rural, imposed on the people in the West, reduced many people to de facto serfs. It tied them to the land and forced them to produce exports. In the East, land and property owned by the Catholic Church was seized and sold to pay off debts. Citizens of the former Spanish Haiti were reduced to second-class citizens, as their property was increasingly confiscated to pay for debts. Every year, the people lost more and more rights as the government desperately searched for revenue to send to Europe. Haiti's need to export goods grew in order to keep paying off the debt. And so, Haiti turned to timber, an industry that had previously been restricted by law. Timber wood was a profitable export, but it wasn't as renewable as sugar or cotton, and before long, Haiti began to be noticeably deforested. This continues throughout Haiti's history, and by 1900, Haiti's once vast forests, so admired by Columbus, will be gone, leaving the barren island that we know today. In spite of all of this effort, the debt persisted. By the 1840s, civil unrest was growing, with Boyer barely managing to keep the young nation from splintering under the crushing weight of the payments. In 1842, his efforts began to fall apart due to factors that the economy wasn't prepared for. It started with a massive earthquake. This severely damaged the island, and among other things required the abandonment of the symbol of Haiti's power, the Citadel La Ferriere. This infrastructure damage, unable to be repaired quickly with the strained budget, resulted in a fire in 1843 that destroyed the capital. At the same time, Cuts to military spending had reduced the Haitian army to a shadow of its former self. The former landowners from the east saw their chance. First, they funded rebels in Haiti, who gleefully exiled Boyer due to his austerity measures. He had tried to do the best that he could for his people, and still meet the terms of the European banks, but it wasn't enough. He would live the rest of his life in exile, dying in Paris in 1850. Back in 1844, with Haiti in disarray and with the help of a private army to reinforce the disaffected people, the landowners launched the Dominican War of Independence the following year. The Haitian army couldn't defeat the Dominicans. No one is certain of the specific number of casualties, but it is known that Haiti lost nearly every single battle, a complete turnaround from 20 years before, showing just how much the debt crisis had damaged Haiti. Without any revenue coming from the Dominican side of the island, the remaining indemnity, designed for the full island, was now only for Western Haiti to pay. The next several decades would be brutal. Haiti's government would undergo revolution after revolution without a single leader finishing their term. No leader was able to balance the budget. The debt would constantly hang over Haiti's finances, crippling it for years to come. None of this was a secret at the time. The value being extracted from Haiti by banks was widely known in France. For example, in The Count of Monte Cristo, published in 1844, the villainous character Danglars was written to have amassed his ill-gotten fortune partially by trading in Haitian bonds. The double debt from 1825 wouldn't be paid off completely until 1910 due to the constant refinancing and additional loans. The final payment on the original indemnity wouldn't be paid until 1947. It's estimated that 166 million francs in debt, interest, and fees ended up being paid out of Haiti over the course of the 122 years of indemnity. By 1880, an organization called the Banque Nationale was in charge of Haiti's treasury. 
Headquartered in Paris, it had agencies throughout the country to control most aspects of finance without any oversight, leading to illegal bonds being issued, forgery, and graft. And finally, we reach that certain bank that I mentioned at the start of our story, the National City Bank of New York. Into the 20th century, Haiti had kept its constitutional provision preventing foreigners from owning land. America's growing capitalist empire was hungry for the investment opportunities that Haiti could provide. In particular, the National City Bank was still very interested in profiting from the still substantial Haitian debts. Haiti was paying 80% of its national budget to servicing debt payments, and National City Bank wanted the money. Starting in 1909, National City Bank bought bonds for the Haitian Railroad Company. This would expand the following year into buying treasury bonds from France. When the Bank Nationale was broken up in 1910, National City Bank owned shares of the successor. Four years later, in 1914, National City Bank was the main controlling force on the board that ran Haiti's bank. Knowing that Haiti couldn't fight back, the National City Bank's lead lobbyist and vice president, Roger Farnham, fed information to the United States Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, whom you might know for his role in the Scopes Monkey Trial or his populist politics. Farnham's goal was to convince Bryan that the Haitian people would love for America to bring peace and stability. Among other things, Farnham argued that the instability in Haiti was being funded by foreign merchants in exchange for Haitian gold, or controlling interest in export contracts. He also had a white supremacist ideology, insisting that the people of Haiti were racially incapable of self-governance or running an economy. Farnham had an extremely detailed white supremacist framework, which he plainly and unashamedly argued in front of the United States Congress. Farnham specifically claimed that it took two Haitian people to do the work of one Jamaican person, and five to match an Irish person, because they, quote, lacked muscular strength. Far from being just a single racist person, Farnham was part of a whole system of racial capitalism being used by National City Bank and others to portray the people of other nations as weak and docile, and just needed Americans to come in and run things for them. In 1915, the United States landed Marines on the island, took over its finances, and overturned the Constitution. An estimated 3,000 Haitians died trying to resist U.S. occupation, and thousands more were killed despite being civilians. Even more were killed in work camps. Total deaths may have been up to 15,000. The stated goals of this invasion were to bring stability and to build infrastructure, but of course, none of that happened to any real degree. Instead, in 1919, the National City Bank purchased the Bank of Haiti. Then, in 1922, the National City Bank purchased all of the debt from France. This put Haiti in an interesting position. Namely, its people were paying taxes to pay off a debt that they owed to their own bank. But all of the money from said repayments left the country and went to New York. Civil rights activists, journalists, and others most famously the diplomat, lawyer, and professor James Weldon Johnson, attempted to sound the alarm bells about what was going on in Haiti, but were generally ignored by the wider public. Johnson wrote three articles for Nation, pointing out Roger Farnham's meddling in Haitian affairs, and accused him of essentially single-handedly masterminding the entire invasion. Though, later historians would find Johnson's accusations were a little myopic, Farnham was in a unique position to steer interventionism, but he was merely one agent acting on behalf of National City Bank's goals. The whole enterprise was steering the same direction. The U.S. would not leave officially until 1934, but U.S. banks would still maintain financial control of Haiti for decades, functioning as a sort of financial imperialism, instead of one involving boots on the ground. I bring this up because it means France alone was not culpable for the indemnity. America was too. Between 1922 and 1947, Haiti paid taxes to the National City Bank. You would know them better, however, after their 1976 name change to Citibank. With this story of Boyer, of debt and indemnity, I argue that the reason Haiti is impoverished today is chiefly due to the way that France, its banks, and America 
trapped it in a cycle of debt, austerity, and poverty for over 120 years. All of the problems that followed sprang directly out of the debt spiral that Charles X started. It was not a happy story, and the consequences are still being played out today. What can we learn from this story? Well, it's important to understand that this story isn't unique. This story has repeated with different actors over and over again. In 2010, Greece was in the middle of a severe debt crisis of its own. Banks demanded payment, and so Greece too, just like Haiti, conceded to the demands of the banks. This time, the banks were represented by the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, collectively called the Troika. Just like with Haiti, Greece was forced to implement severe austerity measures to pay off their debts, and the people suffered the worst of it. The economy contracted, and GDP fell over 25%. Unemployment spiked to 23%. Greece was forced to sell all of its nationalized industries to private investors, raise taxes, cut benefit programs, and still it was forced to default anyway in 2015. The story of the Greek debt crisis is a full story of its own, and is covered in detail by many other videos and articles. Rather than cover it here, it makes an excellent example of what I believe we can learn from our story. Debt is a powerful political tool, and it has been used for controlling nations by nearly every global power today. Not just Greece, but every nation that the IMF and large international banks fund have been forced to implement pro-capital austerity measures that hurt their poor to benefit the international rich. Another recent example is taking place in Puerto Rico today. A confluence of factors led this U.S. territory to wind up deeply indebted and unable to generate enough revenue to pay the debts. The hedge funds who owned the debt were incensed by the idea of Puerto Rico declaring bankruptcy. As a U.S. territory, Puerto Rico was exempt from bankruptcy law, so the hedge funds demanded repayment regardless of the cost because they claimed they only invested in the debt under the assumption that there was no way to discharge it. This came to a head in 2015, as the island entered forbearance, getting loans merely to hold off defaulting on the existing loans. And in 2016, the US government responded by creating an oversight board which took control of the economy of the island. This board, based in New York, made all of the decisions about the territory's finances from their offices based on reports and discussions with lawyers, rarely visiting in person. Ostensibly, they were in charge of getting the island out of debt, but in reality, they exist primarily to ensure that the creditors and hedge funds get their money. To this day, they continue to force higher taxes, rerouting budgets to offshore creditor accounts, close schools, and threaten to cancel employee pension plans, as they've reclassified pensioners as unsecured creditors. That's not even including the hundreds of millions of Puerto Rican dollars that are going to lawyers arguing the cases. Yet again, debt has been used to take away control from the people and elected government and give it to unelected bureaucrats. Now, for a moment, I would like to speak of my personal opinions on the story of Haiti. I posit that Boyer could have better protected Haiti by fighting France instead of falling into the debt trap. He fell for a common temptation among liberal politicians seeking compromise over the hard work of revolution. I use the term liberal here in the economic sense of the word. A person who subscribes to the idea of free market capitalism. Boyer was unable to buy his nation to freedom. Greece was unable to buy its own either. The politicians repeatedly caved to the IMF. Politicians in Puerto Rico as well are repeating history. They are conceding more and more of their people's rights to finance capital. All of these times, the freedom offered by the banks was merely an illusion. The markets are free, but the people are not, and vast amounts of the island's capital is exported to richer nations, who wind up in control of the money, the businesses, and the laws. Of course, Haiti would have had to fight yet another terrible war, and no doubt they would have to fight many more wars. The hegemony of international imperialist capitalism was not interested in a nation seeking to separate itself from the imperial powers. 
this is where we can learn another valuable lesson. The one thing that Haiti needed more than its powerful army was friends. It needed other nations to support it, to offer their navies to combat France. More importantly than the military aid, though, was simply having a place to sell goods. Haiti could have been vastly wealthy if the large and profitable Haitian plantations simply had a place to export to that wasn't willing to accept the French embargo. Over and over, we see nations who resist imperial powers become subject to blockades and embargoes at best, and invasion at worst. Cuba is still under an American embargo, 60 years after rejecting American control over its affairs. This economic war costs Cuba millions of dollars every year in lost revenue. And, if UN votes are to be used as a measure, there are only two nations on Earth who still want it to stay in place, one of which is the United States. While the U.S. claims it is trying to force Cuba to adopt, quote, democracy, it is obvious to everyone else that the U.S. is plainly engaging in open imperialism and trying to use finance to force Cuba to obey, just like France did to Haiti all those years ago. Again, in my opinion, what these nations who seek to resist financial imperialism need to do is to form an alliance of international aid between them, then they would no longer need to rely on loans from the IMF or from debt to foreign banks. Finally, I would like to ask the obvious question many of you are surely thinking. What can be done to help Haiti today? One of the direct things being asked by Haitians and activists is for France to give a cash payment to Haiti directly in order to repay the indemnity. The benefit of this is obvious, as Haiti could use the money immediately to fix many of the problems of its poverty. However, Haiti's problems have been compounded over the decades. A lump sum payment doesn't repay the lost growth from 200 years of missed investment. And today, corruption has become so endemic, and political instability is so severe, that it's likely that much of the money would never reach the hands of the poor. We've seen from numerous aid programs, including the ones following the recent series of earthquakes, that the money is simply taken. It's used to pay debts before anyone sees it, then the capitalists take their share, government officials shave more off the top, and nearly none of it winds up in the hands of the poor. Last year, Haiti's president, Jovenel Moise, was assassinated. And while this video was being written, there was an assassination attempt on the prime minister, Ariel Henry. One of the reasons cited that Moise may have been assassinated was that people viewed him as being deeply corrupt. While this may or may not have been the reason, as it was a very complex situation, the point that I'm trying to make is that the Haitian people have no faith in their government to distribute the money from repaying the indemnity. This money would undeniably be a good thing, but I don't believe it's the best thing for Haiti. Foreign investment in nonprofit charity is another proposed solution. I could tell you another story, a story of failed investments, of the Clinton Foundation, and of broken promises, but I think I will save that for another day. Instead, I must ask you to look at Haiti's past and know that the Haitian people never wanted foreign investment. They do not want to be workers at an enterprise where the profits go to a capitalist in another nation. Just like with a cash infusion, nonprofit aid may also simply disappear due to corruption. Neither of these is a permanent solution. So, my proposed answer is for the Haitian people to look internally, to work to build a mass movement of their own, and to build a political party that stands for the Haitian people against the moneyed interests. This is a tall order, however, and every such effort in Haiti's past has been sabotaged by imperialist powers. What I offer to you is that the best thing that you can do if you are a person who lives outside of Haiti is to stand up to your own government's meddling in Haiti's affairs. What Haiti needs is allies, and you can be one. Demand an end to constantly trying to control Haiti, and allow it to exist as a friend, not as an ATM. This, too, is not easy. Even in wealthy countries, the government rarely listens to the people, but it is essential. As long as the United States, France, and other nations extract Haiti's wealth, it can never be the rich nation it once was. In wealthy nations, too, people need to join together and demand their government represent their interests, 
not those of finance capital. Exploiting Haiti is not in the interest of the American people, nor the French, nor anyone else. The only ones who benefit in any significant way from extracting Haiti's wealth are the bankers, hedge fund managers, and investors who are doing the extraction. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this story, and I hope you learned something that you will find valuable. If you did, you can help me by giving this video a like below or a comment. This will ensure that more people see this video. I want to keep this library civil, so I will delete harassing comments. I intend to tell more stories in the future, so please subscribe if you would like to join me again. If you would like to donate to help me fund telling these stories, I have a Patreon link in the description, along with my sources.